Welcome. Hello and welcome everyone to the eighth appointment of the IFAD Innovation Talks. Today, we will be discussing how increased inter-African trade has the potential to stabilize regional food supplies, increase the resilience of markets to deal with climate and economic shocks, and give farmers access to larger and more lucrative regional markets. Today's event is being run jointly by the Change Delivery and Innovation Unit and the East and Southern Africa Regional Division at IFAD in partnership with the Academia 2063 and IFPRI. Before we start, I would like to remind you that today's event is being recorded. By joining the event, you are agreeing to the recording taking place and for it to be shared in our platforms. As usual, due to time limitations and our aim to focus on content, I won't be introducing in detail our speakers. So this is an invitation to visit our event page to check the speaker profiles and the events concept note agenda and other relevant materials to today's event. John is sharing right now with you the link in the chat box. Without much further ado, I am pleased to introduce Usman Badian, Executive Chairperson at Academia 2063. Usman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gladys. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I would also like to say thank you to our colleagues uh, from IFAT for hosting us. In addition to you, Satu and, and Sarah, we are honored. Um, it's good to share the floor with uh, uh, Komla from EFCFTA and Elizabeth from PAFO. So we are uh, excited to present um, the um, MAMO, I'm sorry, the um, uh, ATM report here uh, on this event. That is the only publication that is dedicated to agricultural trade uh, in Africa. I think this is um, uh, edition number four. It is um, uh, produced uh, jointly uh, by IFPRI, uh, Academia 2063, and uh, the network of researchers uh, working on the AgroDEP, the African Growth and Development Policy Modeling Consortium. Uh, it is a rich uh, and well-informed uh, uh, and detailed report. It covers issues that we do care about, that we would like to know of when you talk about trade, uh, issues around uh, patterns of African agricultural trade, performance in global markets, um, the pace of uh, intensification of uh, intra-regional trade, competitiveness and its drivers, what uh, regional trade performance has in terms of implications at the macro level for growth, for employment, uh, for food security, uh, the implication for issues like uh, equity, uh, gender. Uh, it provides that in-depth look that we need to understand how we can boost performance uh, in, in global uh, markets, but also how we can achieve the ambitions of uh, scaling up intra-African trade as we have under the uh, African Continental Trade Trade um, uh, Agreement. So it is a timely uh, publication. Uh, a, a fortunate coincidence, we launched it in 2018, and I think a couple of years later, uh, the FCFTA was approved uh, by uh, 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 sufficient countries for it uh, uh, to become effective. We will continue this partnership in particular with uh, the AgroDEP researchers across the continent, uh, represented here today by Professor Shahir, to mobilize African expertise, to build on our partnership uh, with IFPRI, and uh, our colleagues across uh, the continent to continue to provide the best evidence that could guide not just African continent trade area, but individual countries in shaping their trade agenda and understanding the dynamics. And for all of us, us to see what we really would like to see, an Africa that plays in global markets by its weight, an Africa that can uh, um, uh, expand uh, rapidly uh, cross-border trade across all regions. So thank you for joining us here today. And we look forward to a very uh, um, interesting session from our colleagues around here. Thank you, Gladys, and back to you. Thank you so much, Usman. That uh, was a very, very effective uh, intervention. I would like to now introduce uh, the keynote speakers of today's event. First, please allow me to welcome Antoine Boue, Senior Research Fellow of the Markets and Trade Division at IFPRI. Antoine will be discussing the impact of COVID-19 on Africa's agricultural trade based on the findings in the Agri Africa Agriculture Trade Monitor, or AATM. Antoine, over to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Gladys. And uh, so I would like to, to give you, um, I hope that you, you see my screen right now, uh, to give you uh, a, um, a summary of the of the African Agriculture Trade Monitor 2021. So um, it's a, a joint publication by IFPRI and Academia 2063. Um, and um, the idea, as mentioned by Usman, and it was mentioned, it was Usman that had the, the, the idea, you know, of gathering and collecting statistics about African agricultural trade in a single report. And so it's very interesting because uh, if you want to have, uh, uh, if you have a specific request about what's happening in terms of this country producing uh, these uh, products and exporting it to this destination, you can find this information in this report. And so the structure is uh, systematically the same. It is an annual report which is uh, released early September every year. And we have a look at uh, Africa in global agricultural trade, but also uh, intra-African intra trade integrations. We, we have a look also at the specific value chains. And we have one topical chapter, which was uh, in 2021, the impact of COVID-19. And we have the last chapter, which is a regional chapter. And, and this is a, a, a report which is uh, designed, written, and uh, done by African uh, economists. So there is only me, who are not African, with jolly curts, but all authors are from Africa. And this is really important because uh, we have a very competent and good economist in Africa. Uh, and the objective is to uh, present recent trends in uh, Africa concerning agricultural trade and to provide policy recommendation. And so the, the, the requirement is to have a, a consistent and coherent database. And this is, a, you know, this is an issue because the official database come trade from the United Nations is not completely reliable. So what we do is that we make some statistical treatment in order to have more uh, consistent and coherent uh, data. And we provide also consistent trade indicators. And so this is also uh, very important. So if you have a look at uh, Africa, uh, the AATM 2021 or the, the previous ones, you will see, so for example, this type of graph, which shows that there is a long-term augmentation of uh, intra-African agricultural trade, and especially in terms of processed products. So this is really important. Uh, uh, and in particular uh, related to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, because it's, uh, I think it's a, a very good reason for launching this uh, trade agreement. Um, and another way of illustrating this is to calculate trivial comparative advantage that we can, uh, it is a trade indicator that shows if uh, Africa has a comparative advantage in one product or not. And here we do it uh, at the level of eight uh, sectors, animal, plants, coffee, and so on. And, and we differentiate by processed, semi-processed, and unprocessed. And we have good news. So for example, in oil seeds and tobacco, we have an increase in the number of trivial comparative advantage of Africa in, in processed products. Uh, while it's not so good in uh, plants, and the coffee, for example, because there is a decrease in the number of trivial comparative advantage. So we have this kind of, of indicators. Another uh, in, important feature that uh, come from the last two reports is uh, the fact that the, the major part of intracontinental trade is intra-regional economic community. So for example, here, you have a beautiful graph which was designed by Sunday Ojo uh, and, and you see, uh, for example, for SADC, Southern African Development Community, uh, the plain line, which is intracontinental exports, and the dotted line, which is intra-regional exports. And so you see that most of the intracontinental exports of SADC are intra-regional economic community. Uh, and it is the same thing for all other uh, regional economic communities. So it means that a major part of intracontinental trade is intra-regional economic community. Um, I think that, oh, excuse me. 
Another way of illustrating that is with this graph, which was designed by Anatol Dundam. It is in the 2021 report, and it sh shows exactly the same con conclusions, but at the level, the, uh, different level of geographical de disaggregation. So concerning the impact of COVID-19 on Africa, uh, in, in chapter five of this report, we have identified channels of transmissions. And of course it was national uh, sanitary measures uh, uh, which provoked the, 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 the economic crisis. Uh, we have a special look also at, uh, internal the, at measures uh, uh, implemented at the border. And so we had, for example, closure of African borders to the movement of people, but also sanitary control at borders and curfews, which were not coordinated, which was not very good. Uh, and and uh, we also uh, examine the, the, the different factors that have provoked the economic crisis and the international transmissions of this economic crisis. And of course, it is related to the specializations of African economies in energy and mineral products, but also it is due to remittances, tourism, and international aid. And here you have a graph uh, which shows uh, export restriction measure. And so you see that um, it, it was different from the previous big world crisis in 2007, 2008, because countries have started to implement export restriction, but it was very short and the impact was not uh, very uh, important because it lasted only uh, between March and April. Uh, on, on the bottom, you have the closure of African borders and you see that more and more we had uh, this closure. And of course, it is at the same time with the implementations of sanitary uh, controls at borders, which in increase the cost for transportations. But the problem is that uh, there was an interdiction of movement of people, which had big repercussions on uh, informal trade, uh, which is uh, very often the movement uh, related to the movement of individuals. And so, for example, in the report, we have uh, this graph with uh, the decrease of uh, trade in 2020 as compared to 2019 not only of formal trade, but in, of informal trade, but the shock on informal trade was very, very big. And so in conclusion, my conclusion is that first, uh, we have more and more processed products in intra-African agricultural trade, uh, and it's a different kind of trade as compared to trade between Africa and the rest of the world. Uh, I would like to say that uh, regional value chains are closely linked to the fact that trading costs are very, very low. And the reason is that there are many crossing of the borders. There are still significant trade barriers in Africa between regional economic communities, so it's really important. And so the potential development of regional value chains in Africa, I think, depends on not only a successful implementations of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement related to negotiations on tariff and non-tariff measure, but also structural actions concerning infrastructure and custom procedure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Antoine. Uh, I would like to highlight what Antoine shared with us in terms of uh, the team dedicating efforts at the beginning before arriving to the analysis and conclusion to uh, working on data consistency, data reliability, and the quality of, uh, of such data. So thank you so much, Antoine, for, for those remarks. So continuing on our focus on the Africa Agriculture Trade Monitor, I would like to introduce our next keynote speaker, Sunday Odio, Deputy Director of the Knowledge Systems Division at Academia 2063, who will, who will be discussing the potential for regional trade to stabilize markets and increase resilience of the smallholder farmers. Over to you, Sunday. Thank you. So if you're speaking, we are unable to hear you right now. Sunday, once again, um, you might need to unmute yourself. Thank you.
Sunday, you are muted. Sunday, we cannot, we, we still cannot hear you. We'll give it a couple more seconds. Sunday, we can see you, but we cannot hear you. Okay. In the interest of time, um, Sunday, if that's okay with you, I'm going to get back to you uh, later. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to ask uh, Oliver to um, position the slide of the panel so that we can move to Shahir and uh, our panelists, please. Thank you so much. So I would like to introduce today's panel. Please join me welcoming uh, Sara Mbagobunu, Director of IFAT's East and Southern Africa Division. Elizabeth Simadala, Director in Charge of Women Affairs, Pan-Africa Farmers Association Organization. Komla Bisi, Senior Advisor on Agriculture, Trade and, Agri and Agriculture Value Chains Development at the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. And uh, moderating the panel today will be Shahir Saki, Associate Professor at Cairo University. Thank you so much. Welcome to the panel. Shahir, over to you. Thank you, Gladys. Uh, thank you all for inviting me to moderate this interesting session. Uh, so uh, we'll be mainly discussing about uh, trade in Africa and how to uh, improve the effectiveness of the African Free Trade Continental Agreement. So we'll build on uh, what Antoine has just mentioned in terms of the structure of trade in Africa and agricultural products. And uh, we have a series of questions uh, that we'll address to our experts. So please don't hesitate to add any uh, further questions in the uh, uh, chat box. Uh, so I will start immediately uh, as we're running out of time. Uh, and I will, add, I will address uh, my question to um, Elizabeth uh, Nismadala, uh, the director in charge of Women Affairs Pan Africa Farmers Organization. And uh, I would like mainly to um, uh, ask the following question, Elizabeth. So, what, from your perspective, what is the role of innovation uh, and intra African trade in accelerating the recovery of uh, African economies uh, after the pandemic? And in this regard, also, what would be the role of, of innovation uh, in regional trade in order to uh, stabilize? and uh, make uh, domestic food supplies uh, more resilient. So the, over to you, Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, moderator, for giving me the opportunity. And uh, I would like to appreciate uh, IFAD for inviting farmers uh, to these uh, innovation talks. Of course, speaking about agriculture and smallholder farmers, we as farmers, uh, this discussion is at our hearts. So the resilience that smallholder farmers have fueled till to date can be further improved by innovation and intra-Africa trade. And I think you all agree with me. You are well aware of the challenges that were posed by the pandemic as were uh, mentioned by Badiani and Toini in their presentations. Uh, this included the total lockdown that put movement at standstill and farmers were not able to access markets, more especially the global markets as well as the domestic markets. Farmers were not able to access inputs and others who were operating different farms made huge losses because they could not supervise their farms nor deliver required inputs like animal feeds. Therefore, this discussion really comes timely and hence the role of innovation and intra-African trade in accelerating the recovery of African economies from the impact of COVID-19 is very critical. First, in terms of addressing the above challenges, as farmers, we adopted farmer-led innovations. Uh, for our case, as uh, we adopted the e-granary that would collect data on farmers. And with this, we would know where the farmers are located. We would aggregate their input demand, and as a federation, we would deliver them to their associations and cooperatives. The same for the output, uh, we would aggregate it, negotiate contracts and organize for logistics to deliver the produce. The feedback from our farmers also would get it through our call centers that help to organize 
and also uh, mobilize for protection equipment like the masks, uh, sanitizers that would deliver to the farmers. And on this, I would like to appreciate IFAD for the SAFE 2024 project that supported the recovery, but also the FL for ACP, which is supporting all the regional farmers organizations and GASP that supported uh, the eGranary initiative. Why am I bringing the eGranary initiative? It's just to show you the role that innovations can play, and more especially the farmer aid innovations. And if we had uh, several of these, uh, then they would make uh, farmers uh, more resilient. On intra-Africa trade, uh, it is well documented. It was well, uh, very well argued uh, before countries ratified the Africa continental free trade area, uh, which was looked at as opening a new chapter for the continent to trade uh, within. And of course, it's uh, positive impacts on the economies of Africa. This can as well be supported again by the challenges that we faced uh, uh, by the, uh, uh, as a result of the pandemic and the many lessons uh, that we've learned, uh, especially on the uh, international trade, the closure of air transport and, and so forth. Much as we had uh, cross-border challenges, this could be addressed by the regional economic communities and different uh, countries that were involved. So we fully believe that under the Africa continental free trade area, the continent can develop and strengthen regional value chains and of course offer countries an opportunity to use regional advantages to boost competitiveness, to diversify on product supply and export products with higher value added. Of course, this would help to caution Africa from future economic shocks and lockdowns. In terms of the role that innovation can play in uh, regional trade in terms of stabilizing domestic uh, food supplies, and increasing the resilience of markets to local production and, uh, and price shocks. I would like to, you know, to borrow um, the work that we did as Eastern Africa Farmers Federation to be able to address this question. And this is in a, an, a position paper uh, that we wrote uh, on bans on regional trade in maize grain, uh, which was published on the 26th of March, 2021 with the support from uh, IFAT uh, and the uh, Farmers Organization for Africa, Caribbean and Pacific. So you all heard about the bans in East Africa between Uganda and Kenya on dairy and maize. So um, this um, was caused, of course, by the high demand of maize, uh, which we've seen rising for the last many uh, years. And of course, um, this, uh, these, um, have been, these issues are usually caused by the production of maize in Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya. And partly it's because of the uh, an availability of substantive suitable land for maize production, especially in Kenya, and also the cost of production. When you compare the cost of production in Tanzania and Uganda, it is cheaper than producing uh, in Kenya. So uh, this has led, of course, to differentiation in terms of prices that provide opportunities, uh, of course, to countries like uh, Uganda and, and Tanzania. So what has this led to? The regional inflows of, of maize grain that have helped Kenya reduce the structure gap in the year maize surprise as reported, for example, by the Fusimate uh, supply outlook uh, October report of the 2020 has um, put it that uh, the domestic maize balance sheet is usually positive in Uganda and Tanzania than it is on average uh, in Kenya. So part of the surplus production from Uganda and Tanzania is traded to Kenya as imports and has really affected um, and reduced the gap between domestic production and the consumption, as well as uh, stabilizing prices in Kenya. So on the other hand, the expanded market in Kenya with relatively higher prices has partially spurred increased production in Uganda and Tanzania as farm profitability improves, thus creating wealth in these neighboring countries. So how do I conclude? But the innovation is required, of course, to boost the regional trade. And this is mainly in terms of digitalizing the services to make sure that we address the challenges that are faced at, uh, at, at the cross-border points, but also in terms of production, challenges to do with access to financing, challenges to do with access to insurance, but also in terms of administration, uh, reducing the cost, of, um, the cost of the management costs because you're able to digitize uh, everything. But also, now we need to um, Elizabeth, look back I'm, to I'm sorry, we're running out of time. <laughs> yes, I've, I've actually concluded in terms of traceability, and this will help in reducing transaction costs. 
Thank you and over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth. So uh, building on uh, the first question, as it was highlighted by Elizabeth, that uh, probably the FCFTA will have uh, an important role uh, in this regard. So I will address now my questions, my question to Komla BC uh, from the AFCFTA. And uh, mainly, uh, we'd like to know uh, from, your, from your perspective, what are the potential benefits of the FCFTA implementation uh, given that it was uh, that it was uh, I mean implemented in uh, January 2021, and to what extent the AFC FTA will increase uh, intra-African uh, trade for uh, local producers, and uh, from the secretariat level as well, what are the next steps uh, that will help us uh, advance uh, in terms of the AFC FTA uh, implementation? Over to you, Kamla. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, once again, and a uh, uh, good day to uh, all participants. Uh, <clears throat> it is evident that the AFCFT uh, has taken off and uh, the Secretariat is working um, seriously to impact on the broader trade uh, related interventions on the continent in order to achieve the targets that we have set for ourselves. But more specifically with respect to agriculture, we know that the agriculture is the backbone of our economies and more than 60% of our people are engaged in that. At the same time, our food import bills are high. According to FAO, uh, we currently have about $80 billion per year. Uh, therefore, at the AFCFC Secretariat, our effort is to look at how we can reduce these food import bills so that additional uh, foreign exchange could be reserved or could be saved for our member states. For that matter, uh, first of all, uh, we all are aware that there is a lot of effort within the, in the context of AFCFTA, uh, and a lot of success has also been achieved with respect to our ongoing negotiations on the tariff and the non-tariff measures, et cetera. But it is also recognized that uh, reduction in tariffs alone uh, may not be able to allow us to achieve uh, the potential intra-Africa trade targets that we have set for ourselves. For that matter, the AFCF Secretariat is also looking at some other innovative ways to be able to strengthen uh, productive capacities, to strengthen regional value chains, uh, to, 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 to allow our member states uh, to identify uh, potential value chains that offer the highest potential for intra-Africa trade. In that context, we have been looking at specific value chains. Uh, we have undertaken a couple of analytical work to understand uh, which value chains have the highest potential with respect to economic growth, employment, inclusivity, uh, environmental sustainability, and more importantly, to contribute to the AFCFTA target. Among this, uh, I'm mentioning that uh, value chains, including automobiles, pharmaceuticals, uh, transport and logistics, uh, featured, but agriculture-related value chains uh, seems to have uh, more potentials for contributing to the AFTF, AFCFTA target than the others, even though uh, these potentials also exist in other value chain related areas. But for that matter, we also working to strengthen uh, our border procedures to ensure that our product, uh, products are able to move smoothly and effectively. Therefore, a lot of effort is being put into simplifying uh, border procedures, cross-border regimes, uh, et cetera. But I must mention that there is a huge scope for us to strengthen our data systems. Uh, this is a, a big issue we're facing currently as the Secretariat. How do we gather adequate, credible data on time for us to be able to understand the impact that we're making with respect to achieving the targets in the context of the AFCFTA? For me, this brings into context this discussion and also the contribution that the Africa Agricultural Trade Monitor intends 
to continue to contribute with respect to the AFCFTA implementation. I think there is scope, therefore, with respect to all the innovations that we will be talking about today, to look at how do we collaborate to ensure that we're able to generate sufficient evidence with respect to data to help AFCFTA Secretariat and our member states to appreciate the values and value added for the various trade related interventions and how those are impacting on their economies. Therefore, I would like to suggest that we take this discussion seriously and forward uh, and, and explore options for working together to ensure that we also support the AFCF Secretariat in this regard uh, so that we can be able to appreciate the values that are intended to be achieved with respect to the EFCFT implementation uh, arrangement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kamla, and thank you for highlighting the importance of data. And actually, that was one of the findings that we had also in the ATM uh, 2021 on the importance of data, especially for uh, informal trade uh, that is important, uh, that's an important issue in Africa. And we still don't have a lot of data on that. So uh, my third question uh, now, I will address it to uh, Sarah Mbago from IFAD. And uh, Sarah, from your perspective, uh, how can African countries, region, and continental institutions ensure that in the future, uh, I mean, uh, if we have any kind of external shocks or crisis, how this will uh, be uh, faced and to what extent those institutions can curb uh, the negative effects that we can potentially have on cross-border trade. Over to you, Sara. Thank you very much, uh, Shahi. In fact, um, there are many lessons that the African governments and regional economic communities can draw to share effective response and harmonize cross-border trade. However, I think three areas remain critical and pivotal in recovery and rebuilding back better, more equitable and resilient uh, systems. These three areas are health security, investing in the Africa continental free trade area, and food systems transformation. Um, and very quickly to touch on those three important areas that I'm talking about. Uh, firstly, health security. In order to root out these challenges, a long-term strategic plan needs to be put in place. Investing in health pays dividends twice over. First of all, in times of acute public health emergencies, including the growing challenge of antimicrobial resistance, and secondly, in building healthy and more equitable societies are essential components of, of health security. So what then should governments be focusing on long-term solutions? Uh, firstly, stronger surveillance and governance systems for better national pandemic management capacity and capabilities, decentralization and empowerment of existing local governance structures to facilitate effective community-based coordination. We've also seen the quarantines and at local levels, these seem to be better handled if the community-based healthcare systems receive the investment they need in staffing, testing, and traceability, as well as reporting. And into the long-term, more significant, more predictable funding uh, into the sector so that uh, vaccines can be eventually uh, developed uh, regionally and diagnostic and therapeutics could also be important. This requires continual investment in science. Secondly, Anton made a very good point about the substantial increase of agricultural trade between regional economic communities uh, offered by the African free uh, continental trade area. And this must really be prioritized. So how can we act actively tap into the opportunities that this represents? Potentially $22 billion in trade, according to the UNCTAD uh, report and 43% uh, uh, of which could be inter-regional trade. Uh, so what can governments do here? First, we have to really look at the tariff schedules that's already been mentioned and try to harmonize this in, 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 by all means. Of course, this is sensitive because many governments rely heavily on impact tariffs for their revenues, but this should not be short-sightedly the focus of what we're doing. Uh, we should look into the medium and long term. Secondly, there should be a mechanism for reporting on non-tariff barriers to support the reporting elimination of these non-tariff barriers, which are actually incidentally uh, more challenging and they reduce cross-border trade much more than the tariff schedules. 
Thirdly, we need to reduce the regularity of barriers to trade in services so that we can attract uh, investors in the service sector. This is really important. And uh, lastly, we also need to have a successful negotiation and implementation of uh, the Africa Free Trade Continental Protocol on Investment. I think this is really game changing because it will set down new ground rules for investment across the continent. And once this is harmonized, that will build confidence of investors. Uh, finally, and I have one minute left, I talked about transformation of food systems. We know where they have failed. We need to invest here. We need to incentivize, really incentivize, sorry, incentivize uh, agroecological and nature positive production uh, mechanisms. We need to invest in SMEs, agro SMEs, which are providing essential services to small scale farmers. We need to revisit the unfair pricing uh, as been mentioned earlier, and really cost the real cost of food, uh, which looks into the environment, looks into water use, looks into soil costs, looks at climate emissions. We need to redefine the guidelines uh, around uh, value chains and really get, and I know the AU has started an initiative to other, to, for, for AU country, member countries, we need to, to, to reset the ground rules on food trade. Thank you. Back to you, Shahir. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, your interventions in, uh, and see how uh, innovation data and what are the main lessons learned to, to face future shocks and future crises. Uh, so uh, now uh, we move to the next part of our innovative talk and over to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, um, Shahir. Sunday is back with us, so I would like to give the floor back to uh, Sunday Ojo, Deputy Director at the Knowledge Systems uh, Division at Academia 2063 before we move to the Q&A session. Just a reminder to everybody that is attending today's session to please post any questions that you might have on the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the screen, please. Uh, don't be shy. We are looking forward to engaging with you in the Q&A uh, session of, this, uh, of today's event. Sunday, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? We can hear you. We can see your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, sorry, I couldn't remove uh, this bar on the. I couldn't uh, unmute myself. Uh, sorry for that. Um, so my presentation is uh, uh, today is to uh, try to uh, share with you some research evidence that demonstrate that. Uh, regional trade can help stabilize domestic market and improve resilience at the farmer level. To do that, I will share uh, uh, two slides on recent trends in Africa agricultural trade. Then I will show how uh, computation of three uh, trade outcome indicators uh, help to demonstrate that regional trade can help uh, stabilize uh, domestic market. Then I will finalize with uh, uh, some simulation results that show that if we want really to improve regional trade, this will not require two very uh, not this will not require uh, difficult interventions. Very uh, simple intervention can achieve a, a big uh, uh, outcome. So we, uh, has, uh, we, we have seen with uh, uh, Antoine's presentation, Africa trade is growing. It is growing fast uh, uh, toward, uh, uh, it is growing toward uh, traditional uh, uh, partners like EU and, uh, uh, the BRIC and, and the USA, but it's growing even faster toward the BRIC countries and other ASEAN uh, fast growing countries. But you can see that um, Africa uh, share has destination of Africa export is uh, is a uh, stagnant. Uh, if there is a need there to to find a way to 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 increase it, and at the, these uh, good uh, performance in terms of export growth is translated into a decline in the deficits of the continent of agricultural trade, but the deficit in a major food value chains is continuously increasing. And there, the question is how to improve intra-regional trade to save 
the market opportunity that are missed now because the, this deficit is being uh, uh, fed from outside. The question is also to know if African countries are already trading at the maximum or whether there is uh, opportunity to increase the current trade. And when we look at production situation at country level, we see that despite those uh, fluctuations, we can see at the regional level that production is more stable. So, so with more stable production at regional level, this is an indication that there are excess and uh, so, uh, an excess demand and uh, excess supply uh, countries. So trade could do something there to try to match uh, uh, those two kind of countries. But for that to be possible, we need to see that um, uh, the fluctuation in any two countries are not perfectly correlated. Before, because if correlations, are, if fluctuations are correlated, we can't really see the opportunities for trade between excess and, and excess demand and excess supply countries. And another condition is necessary to check, which we, we, we look at is if there is possibility to trade, if countries are not too uh, similar, because in terms of production and uh, export patterns, if they are too similar, they can't really trade among themselves. But the first two results I show already show that, that uh, there is a potential there, but countries should have something to exchange among themselves. This is why we look at the similarities of, between countries and the results are very uh, 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 clear that African countries are sufficiently dissimilar to the point that they can trade among themselves. If you look at production similarity and export similarity, the, the evidence is clear that African countries have something to trade among themselves. In addition to that, when you look at current flows, you will see that there are overlapping uh, flows. Overlapping flows mean that some countries are exporting outside Africa, the same product that other countries are importing from outside Africa and this vice versa. So we can infer that by redirecting those overlapping flow, which are uh, important toward uh, regional groupings, it is possible to expand transborder trade uh, within the regional uh, economic communities. You can see here that these overlapping flows are not small. At the Africa level, they are as big as 25%, but in uh, SADC, they are as big as uh, close to uh, 40%. So by redirecting those flows to within the RECs, this can uh, really uh, increase uh, uh, the current level of uh, uh, transborder trade. Against this background, we ask now, where are we going if current trends are, uh, are to be continued? Like, that is, we are looking to uh, the trade outlook, the regional trade outlook under the continuation of the trends in terms of crop yields, cultivated areas, population, and GDP. So when Sunday, we look at- yes? Sunday, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to ask you to please start wrapping up. Thank you. Okay. So when you look at that, you will see that for ECOWAS, for example, it is expected that intra-regional trade will expand, will expand. and Syria's, Syria's will have the smallest gains, but Ruba and Tubas will have the highest uh, growth. But this, uh, ex, ex, this expectation will not be enough, that is, the expansion will not be enough because demand is growing faster. So we try here, this is my last slide, to see uh, under which condition or with which uh, simple intervention could uh, help to increase uh, the current level of intra-regional trade. And we, we simulated scenarios 
like a 10% reduction in trade costs, a removal of cross-border trade barriers, and a 10% increase in crop yield. And then you will see that for ECOWAS, for example, cereal responds better than other products. But when you compare the three scenarios, we see that removing transborder trade would have the strongest impact on trade flows. I'm summarizing my uh, message here in three points. That is, we can improve, uh, uh, we can stabilize domestic supply by relying on the fact that uh, production, should, production are more stable at the regional level than at the country level, and the fluctuations are less than uh, perfectly correlated. And the second point is that there are, there, there are possibilities to increase current level of, uh, of regional trade because we saw with two indicators that uh, production and trade patterns are not are very dissimilar among African countries and overlapping trade, uh, overlapping trade flows are very important. And finally, it is uh, possible to increase the resilience of domestic markets by increasing uh, regional trade through very simple intervention that could uh, succeed to reduce overall trading costs or increase uh, yield, uh, crop yield or remove cross border trade barriers. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunday. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation. Uh, let's move quickly to the audience. We have some questions, and I would like to start by giving the floor to Zara um, from IFAD to address Felicia Eboca's question. How can this information pass to the grassroots farmers, to artisanal fishers and processors and traders? I am guessing Felicia is, uh, is referring to the conclusions of the AITM. Sara? Thank you very much. Um, I think we can really leverage digital SMS uh, using new modern tools to reach uh, everyone, even in the last mile areas. Uh, I think uh, we have a good network right across Africa. <laughs> Uh, lots of great initiatives, uh, technology, savvy now, uh, younger population able to use mobile phones, which have reached very far. And this should really be harnessed in a very positive way to explain and communicate trade opportunities, trade information, pricing, uh, really just you know, level the playing field for small scale farmers to be able to negotiate the best deal and understand where the spot markets are, where they can deliver, which markets want what. Thank you, back to you, Gladys. Thank you so much, Sara. Elizabeth, would you like to complement that uh, answer? I see that you have your, your hand up in the Q&A function. Elizabeth? Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. And uh, I, I fully agree with uh, Salah's submission uh, of leveraging on uh, uh, digitization. Uh, for example, uh, cases where you're able to build a database of, uh, of your membership as, as, as farmers, uh, then such information can be transmitted uh, through their mobile phones, for example. But also for farmers organizations, uh, especially that are membership uh, based right from the grassroots up to the different levels, such information is able to flow through their member networks. A case in point is ours, where, for example, information that reaches purple can be transmitted to the regional farmers organization, to national farmers organization, and subnational farmers organizations. Thank you, and over. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, Kombla, I think this question is for you. It's from uh, Sania Terlevich. And the question is, is the African Union the key actor positioned to coordinate the process of aligning trade rules across African regional economic communities, as well as with those outside the continent? for example, the European Union. Komla? Yes, certainly this is the function of the uh, AFCFTA Secretariat uh, is to ensure that trade rules and regulations are harmonized at a continental level. Uh, this is what we we, we driving at. Uh, yes, if, when, wherever there is value to benchmark our rules and regulations to those outside the continent, uh, the continent will be happy to do that. But uh, this is currently not the scope of the AFCF Secretariat, is to strengthen and harmonize our own internal rules to ensure that we are able to trade 
effectively and efficiently among ourselves to take advantage of the opportunities that is offered under this one economic uh, arrangement. Thank you so much, Komla. Let's move to uh, Kadem's uh, question that this is uh, referring to the, he's asking why the African interregional trade trend, relatively low and stagnant share represented in Academia 2063 presentation is different from the one presented by IFPRI, higher overall share. Is it a data source problem? Um, Antoine, and uh, maybe Sunday, would you like to, to address this question? Maybe Antoine first? Yeah, I think that we have to, to look into the, the, how these uh, two graphs and the series of statistics have been uh, designed because maybe there is a question of uh, product coverage or maybe it's a question of um, uh, data with statistics which are in value and others in, uh, at uh, constant uh, prices. So um, um, I cannot tell you right now, but... but uh, the, the origin of the data are the same, I think, and they will confirm. So I don't think that we can have a, a, a huge difference. Um, so um, I just want to ask a question about if there is a, a recovery in informal trade uh, after 2020. So concerning informal trade, um, this is a question that has been uh, raised. Uh, also, and uh, yes, um, we have different systems of collections of informal trade data uh, from uh, West Africa at SILS in Ouagadougou, from uh, FSNWG in Kenya, and also the Uganda Bureau of Statistics. And these systems of collections of informal data show that um, there was a recovery in 2021 as compared to 2020. Uh, the report was released early September 2021, and so the, the, the report, the, the, the completions of the drafting was uh, in June and July 2020, uh, 2021. So this is the reason why we, we didn't have uh, the, the time to include this new data. Uh, the question is first that we are not sure if this recovery is uh, so important uh, because of the quality of these systems of, of data collections. The reason is that they are funded by uh, private donors or international institutions, and these uh, funds can be very uh, irregular. And so the quality of the collection system is not uh, uh, stabilized. Uh, and, and, and this is something which is really important. It was raised by Comla, the, the, we need uh, a system of uh, data collection uh, in terms of agricultural trade in Africa, which is high quality, not only in terms of reliability of the data, but also in terms of timeliness, because we need data on recent, recent trends of uh, agricultural trade in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Antoine. And that was exactly what you were referring to also at the beginning during your keynote remarks. Sunday, would you like to complement that, please? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the question, uh, I didn't get it uh, uh, well. It, it, the comparison was uh, about what? I, I didn't get uh, the, the question well. Okay. Um, let, me, let me see if I, we can go back to the question. Maybe I'm talking it, uh, about it was referring to the difference in the um, presentations. So why the African intra-regional trade trend relatively low and stagnant share presented in Academia 2063 presentation is different from the one presented by IFPRI, which uh, revealed higher overall share. And they were asking if you thought it was a data problem. Okay, thank you. No, it, it, I, don't, I don't think uh, there is a difference because it, we, it is the same data, but uh, in what I presented, it is the shares that you can see, it is the change in the shares, while uh, in Antoine's presentation, it is the levels. So uh, if you, what you can see in my presentation is how the shares change. We are not seeing the levels. Thank you, Sunday. We will address the questions that we were not able to address live um, in writing when we send the, the events takeaways uh, to everybody that registered for today's event. So now I would like to, since we're running out of time, I would like to give the floor to uh, if.
Fats, Associate Vice President of the External Relations and Governance uh, Department. This is the AVP's first IFAD Innovation Talk, and we would like to take advantage of this opportunity also to welcome Satu Santala to IFAD. Satu, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gladys, for, for that um, introduction and for welcoming me. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, today and join um, the, the first IFAD Innovation Talk of this year. Um, and to, to um, hear this rich discussion on uh, uh, how uh, intra-African trade can stabilize regional food supplies, increase market resilience, and give small-scale farmers greater market ex uh, access. It's been really a very interesting and rich discussion, um, and I wish we had more time, but, uh, but maybe just underscore a few points um, to end this discussion with. The first one is that, um, as we've heard today, uh, despite the remarkable development progress in Africa over the, the last two decades, um, and the great potential and achievements in trade, COVID-19 has really taken a toll. Um, just a reminder that in 2019, the number of extreme poor was estimated to be um, 439 million, which is more than two thirds of the world's extreme poor. And the share of the population suffering from hunger and food security is also rising. Uh, in 2020, one in five um, people faced hunger in Africa uh, and about 46 million more people when compared to 2019. So this is really not the, the situation we would have liked to see and, and really um, uh, uh, requires our attention. Uh, these impacts are strongly felt by rural people who are especially vulnerable uh, due to poverty, undernourishment and, and lack of access to health care. As we've also heard today, um, measures to contain the pandemic and its impact in Africa are uh, reducing trade in a region where countries are highly dependent on global trade. Um, and this leads to my second point that we really need to innovate, uh, we, we really need innovative ways to address these challenges. We've heard excellent examples from our panelists and speakers today, uh, including the use of technology and really a, an agile response in, in rapidly changing circumstances. For IFAD, this means uh, solutions that recognize the role of small-scale farmers. For example, IFAD uh, launched a multi-donor COVID-19 rural poor stimulus facility in response to the pandemic to improve rural resi resilience um, in the crisis. Interregional trade and trade policy also play a, a fundamental role in fighting the effects of the pandemic, but policies must be based on evidence and data to, um, for, for good decision making. I think all of our speakers really highlighted this today. Um, and, um, and it's so important to define the appropriate level of interventions, identifying tackle capacity gaps and recognize effective institutions for design and implementation. This is something that IFAD also strongly supports and hence the importance of tools such as the Africa Agriculture Trade Monitor. As we also heard from our keynote speakers, policies, mechanisms, and institutions that promote and support interregional trade uh, can be very valuable in this regard, and they help stabilize dom domestic supplies, reduce trading costs, increase crop yields, uh, and remove trade barriers. This is why the, the conversation around the African continental free trade area today was really interesting. Um, and this uh, agreement really has the potential to uplift about 30 million people from extreme poverty. So very, very important. Um, and in this context, our speakers really highlighted the potential of agriculture um, for the interregional trade um, and for the, the goals of the agreement. Um, as we heard from our speakers, uh, some potential transformations need to, needed to include uh, the harmonization of trade regimes, uh, unification of currencies and policies that promote the free, free movement of people, capacity building, and centralization of key institution. Which then um, leads me to my final point. The changes that are needed um, uh, underscore why it is important that we all work together. If it is very ready to continue providing assistance and contributing to achieve the goals of the AFCFTA, 
um, and our other stakeholders by strengthening collaboration in the region and supporting evidence and science-based decision-making. So I would like to conclude with a very warm thank to our speakers and our partners at today's event, Academia 2063 and IFPRI, as well as my colleagues uh, in the Change, Deliver and Innovation Unit and the Eastern Southern Africa Division of IFAD. And thank you all and thank you to our audience. Thank you so much, Sato. That concludes today's event. I thank you everyone for a very engaging session and we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, IFAD Innovation Talks. We'll be announcing them via the IFAD Innovation Network. Thank you everybody for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sato. Thank you, Gladys, thank you. Shahir. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Bye. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye.